But secondly, and this is completely damning, is that it turns out that this theory of knowledge is self-refuting. You see, you ask yourself the question, how does the skeptic know that knowledge is limited to statements verifiable by the five senses or provable by logic? Dr. Avalos claims to have a knowledge of the following statement, a statement which is unverifiable by the five senses or unprovable by logic cannot be known. But is that statement verifiable by the five senses? No. Is it demonstrable by logic? No. Then it cannot be known. And thus this empiricist epistemology that he's offered as a basis for denying the resurrection is simply untenable and therefore has been widely abandoned in philosophy today as both overly restrictive and self-refuting. But Dr. Avalos says there's another principle involved here, namely you should only prefer explanations based on known causes. Two responses. First of all, I agree that we should prefer explanations based on known causes. That's the same thing as the criterion of not being ad hoc. We should first consider explanations in terms of entities which we know to exist. But this preference can't be hardened into a dogmatic and inviolable presupposition. Otherwise, it would destroy scientific progress. We should never have discovered quarks, black holes, cosmic inflation, and so forth on this epistemology. Sometimes positing a new entity is justified in virtue of the increased explanatory power, explanatory scope, and so forth that it will bring. And so it is, I believe, with the resurrection. Secondly, I think we do have independent evidence of God's existence. So that anybody who is already a theist, when he approaches the evidence for the resurrection, has the explanatory resources for that event. The problem for Dr. Avalos is that he's self-confessedly an atheist. He says in his uh, article in Free Thought Today, I am an atheist the logical consequence is that miracles go down the drain. But you see, most people are not atheists. If you believe in God, then it is not ad hoc to explain the resurrection as an act uh, of God. And I lay out my reasons for believing in God in my book with Walter Sinnott Armstrong, God, a debate between a Christian and an atheist. So maybe next time, if I come back to ISU, we can be debating the existence of God. Given the existence of God, I do not think it is ad hoc to explain the resurrection in terms of God's raising Jesus from the dead. Finally, what about hallucinations? Well, I don't think hallucinations are a plausible counter-explanation. First of all, the uh, number and diversity of the circumstances of the appearances preclude hallucinations. Uh, Jesus didn't appear just one time, but many times, not just to individuals, but to groups, not under just one circumstance, but under many circumstances, not just at one locale, but at many locales, not just to believers, but to doubters, unbelievers, and enemies. It exceeds anything in the case books for psychological disturbances and hallucinations. Secondly, even if they had hallucinated, it would not have explained the origin of the disciples' belief in the resurrection. At most, visions of Jesus would have led them to think that Jesus was now exalted in heaven at the right hand of God. It wouldn't have led to the belief in the resurrection from the dead, which ran contrary to Jewish beliefs. And finally, number three, it can't explain the empty tomb. In order to explain the empty tomb, you have to conjoin some independent hypothesis to the hallucination hypothesis because uh, you can't have a full explanatory scope with hallucinations alone. The resurrection hypothesis has greater explanatory scope and is therefore to be preferred. So for all of these reasons, I Please conclude your remarks. that the best explanation of the facts is the one that the eyewitnesses gave. God raised Jesus from the dead. You will notice he didn't answer my question. Do you believe that Matthew 27, 52 to 53 is literally historically true? He knows he can't answer it because his whole methodology would fall apart once he did. Why don't you believe one story and believe another? It's the same uh, Bible, the same Gospels. Why didn't you answer the question? But let me tell you something about trying to defeat empirical rationalism with empirical rationalism. You can't. Anytime you use logic 
you're using rationalism. Anytime you use, an, uh, you use a, a datum and point to a datum, you're using empiricism. Therefore, you can't use empirical rationalism to argue against empirical rationalism, Dr. Craig. And very simply this, I'm taking a lot of your stuff about how to do history. You said we should then test and uh, test worldviews by their logical consistency and by how well they fit the facts of known experience. Isn't that what I'm saying? This is what you said. We can nonetheless join naturalists, and this is in your edited book, we can then not, nonetheless join naturalists in holding that empirical scientific methods are typically reliable. Well, that's what I'm doing. And you said, now I admit that as a methodological procedure, you ought to seek natural explanations first. Isn't that what I said? The problem still is that he wants to make the post-resurrection, the post-mortem appearances the object of explanation. I'm saying, no, they're not. It's the stories of them. How do you explain the stories? Well, seek natural explanations first. What are the natural explanations? A whole bunch. I can admit ten things over the actual resurrection. But let me tell you why Dr. Craig doesn't want you to know why he doesn't believe in Matthew 27. Let's look at that again. Matthew 27, 52 says, The tombs also were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. After uh, his debate with John Dominic Crossan, he quoted Dr. Miller as follows. Dr. Miller tries to cast doubt on the historicity of the resurrection narratives by arguing that Matthew felt free to add to Mark's gospel the story of the resurrection of the saints, a story which Matthew did not take literally, but saw as a figurative expression of the apocalyptic significance of Jesus' death. Dr. Miller's interpretation of this passage strikes me as quite persuasive, and probably few conservative scholars would treat the story as historical. But why not? Well, he tells us. For he, Dr. Miller, has argued that the passage should not be taken literally precisely because of the apocalyptic language coloring the story. That's why that's not historical. But the empty tomb narrative is remarkable just for its simplicity and lack of apocalyptic embellishment. So let's look at his historical criteria for why he takes, say, Mark 16 literally and historically and not Matthew 27, 52. If you boil it down... It appears to be that a simple story is historically credible. But what, what does simple mean? Is brevity the essence of simplicity, Dr. Craig? Because if that is the case, the one in Matthew 50, 27, 52, and 53 is much briefer than the eight verses in Mark 16 that you take as part of the original text. And then you apparently believe that an apocalyptic story is not historically credible. It's historically incredible. So, let's look at what he might mean. What does simple mean? If it's not brevity, what does he mean? It means, ladies and gentlemen, it's the one that has the least supernatural elements, apparently. He's a naturalist when it comes to that story. In apocalyptic, why does he regard that as unacceptable? It's not something to be believed. That's, that's supposed to be figurative. Because he believes apocalypticism has too much supernaturalism, ladies and gentlemen. Now, when you look at what he said about 1 Corinthians 15, he made a big issue about we must take that historically because of this verb, agaring, to rise. He says the very fact that the verb agaring seems to imply that the grave was left empty. The two, ver two verbs, agaring and a and Anastasi are used synonymously throughout the New Testament. 